Hello, everyone, and we're glad you can attend Attitude's weekly ADHD Experts webinar. Uh, sorry we're a little late today. We had a couple technical difficulties, but they're ironed out now. Uh, just an introductory note before we get started. If you've listened to one of our webinars before, you know we offer attendees a certificate of attendance. When the webinar ends, a post-event survey will pop up. It will list three questions about the quality of the webinar, followed by three questions titled required for certificate. If you'd like a certificate of attendance emailed to you, you should answer those three questions. If you don't want one, want a certificate, you don't have to answer the questions, obviously. Also, one other note, today's webinar sponsor is Play Attention, Enhanced Brain Health and Performance. Play Attention utilizes NASA-inspired technology to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. They will customize your plan and help you thrive at home, school, and work. Includes a lifetime membership. Learn how you can make ADHD your superpower. Click here for a free consultation or call at the hyperlink on your screen or call 800-788-6786 or you can visit playattention.com. Mention Attitude Mag 0220 and receive 10% off your home or professional program and one free ADHD assessment. Attitude thanks our sponsors for supporting our webinars. Sponsorship has no influence on speaker selection or webinar content. Now for the theme of today's webinar, exercise and ADHD. There's lots of evidence that shows that exercise helps children and adults, adults, excuse me, manage their symptoms of ADHD. Movement turns on the brain's attention networks and eases other symptoms of ADHD, such as hyperactivity. Physical activity also benefits the ADHD brain by elevating levels of dopamine and norepinephrine, two chemicals linked to attention. Studies also show that a steady diet of movement and vigorous play has a positive effect on behavior and motivation, resulting in better school performance and better self-esteem. Overall, physical activity is a go-to treatment that parents and adults can use to better their lives with ADHD. We are very happy to have Patrick LeCount here today to talk about the latest science behind the benefits of exercise for the ADHD brain. He will also give us strategies for making our exercise wish list a reality by making physical movement more achievable. Patrick is a postdoctoral fellow in the Center for Child Health, Behavior and Development at Seattle Children's Research Institute. His work focuses on the manifestation and treatment of ADHD in adolescence and early childhood. Patrick studies how health behaviors, particularly physical exercise, can be leveraged to improve the self-management of ADHD and the health of teens and young adults with ADHD. You can ask questions of Patrick at any time during the webinar. We will try to get to as many of them as we can after his presentation. To download the presentation slides of this webinar, click the drop-down menu labeled Event Resources on the bottom left of your screen. If you do not see the Event Resources tab, you need to refresh the page. So now, finally, let me turn it over to Patrick. Thanks for being here today, Patrick. I really appreciate it, and so does everyone else. Uh, Everyone's very curious about the benefits of exercise. So take it away. No, oh, I appreciate it. Um, so real quick, uh, just want to go over uh, some disclosures uh, as a good scientist. So first off, I am a volunteer research consultant for the How to ADHD YouTube channel. Uh, some of y'all might know that one. I've been working with Jessica for a couple of years now. Uh, basically just helping her do the research back end on some of her videos, including one on exercise and ADHD. Um, also, I've received funding uh, through an IDEA award from NIGMS, uh, Charles Casier Research Fellowship, and Lily Importing Your Dissertation Award. Um, and of course, all contents are solely the responsibility of myself and do not necessarily represent the views of these agencies. So. Getting into today, so um, fun fact, uh, getting ready for this webinar, my uh, fire detector, smoke detector in my apartment, uh, the battery is low and I have high uh, ceilings in my apartment and couldn't reach it. And so I had to run up here and uh, get this set up. So 
catching my breath a little bit, but you know, I think it's well aligned with the, the seminar today. Um, so let's see. Uh, the goals for today is first talking about the benefits of exercise. Um, we, you know, there's a robust literature on the benefits of physical exercise for improving physical health. Um, but as far as mental health, that's been getting increasing attention in recent years and uh, from the community at large, but also the scientific community. We're paying a little bit more attention to that. Next, I wanna go into the neuropsychological factors that can make exercise particularly beneficial for those with ADHD. So we know that ADHD, or exercise is helpful for improving cognitive functioning. There's a robust literature on that. So why can't we just recommend that for everyone? Um, why should we care specifically about ADHD? Is there anything unique about that disorder and the benefits of exercise? Uh, that means we could get uniquely beneficial effects. Um, so, and then next we're gonna go into the latest research on some of the benefits of physical exercise and ADHD. Again, this is pretty new. Um, so what do we know about it? Uh, what's What's been going on with it? Uh, what are some of the work that me and my colleagues are doing? Um, and yeah, what, what are the limitations? What are the future directions? And then next, uh, getting into strategies. So what are, what can you do? <laughs> Given this information, what can I do? What, what can my child do? Um, what can we do to improve our level of physical activity? Because it's no secret that most people have a hard time reaching physical activity benchmarks. And we find that can be especially hard for uh, families, uh, adults, children who have ADHD. There's some additional barriers there. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, so a little bit of background. Um, so how did I get into this? Uh, so I started grad school and I played a bit of hockey in college, uh, played all the way up through college. And then I went to grad school, you know, I won the lottery, <laughs> I got in and I said, you know, there's no time for this tomfoolery. Uh, I'm here to learn, I'm here to do science, uh, let's, let's do it. And so I wasn't exercising, I was just, doing grad school. And uh, I was in my advisor's lab, Cynthia Hardtongue. And I remember, I think about six months in, uh, went into her office for kind of end of first semester check-in and I was cracking, um, bursting at the seams. I don't know. I was like, I don't know what to do. And she said, okay, calm down. It's all right. World's on fire, but you're fine. It's okay. And, uh, you know, she said, I remember you, you were pretty physically active when I interviewed you. Um, you know, you were doing hockey, you had this Taekwondo background. Uh, what, what are you doing now? And I said, nothing, of course. Like, why? What? <laughs> I don't have time for that. And uh, she said, well, that's a problem. And, uh, you know, she made a point of saying, you know, I, I think we should make that a goal. And I want to support that in, you know, your overall well-being because that's important for you. And if that, if that foundation isn't good, you're not gonna be able to handle the intense stressors of graduate school. So it just so happened that she was getting ready to start the boot camp for CrossFit. Um, so it's kind of like an intro to CrossFit and I joined her and her husband in that and I've been hooked ever since. I drank the Kool-Aid. Um, so uh, this is a picture of uh, some individuals from our research department, from our psych department at the University of Wyoming. And we actually set up a workout where we could go and do that because uh, later on for my dissertation, I started to wonder, okay, a lot of people report anecdotally, exercise helps me, my kid manage ADHD or manage stress or anxiety that's co-occurring with ADHD. And I was kind of surprised to see either the quality of the research or the lack of the research that had actually been done on this question, yet so many people in the community were screaming for it. So that's what I've been dedicating a lot of my energy to recently is exploring uh, the benefits of physical exercise for ADHD. So diving in, yeah. So I've um, got some lovely comic strips. I hope you enjoy the humor as much as I do. Um, all credit to them, uh, fantastic work. Uh, so physical health, like I said before, there's a robust literature that exercise improves 
um, health outcomes. Now, diet, I would say, is probably closer to 80 to 90 percent as far as you know body composition, obesity goes. Um, it's really hard to outwork a bad diet unless you're an elite athlete. And I've had to come to realize as I've turned 30 that uh, I'm not an elite athlete. Uh, I can't eat the way that I used to. So um, you can't outwork a bad diet. Um, so that's way more important as far as obesity goes and some other concerns such as diabetes maybe, but it's still very beneficial. But there's also been increasing attention to mental health and this largely started in the depression, anxiety and stress community or what we would call internalizing problems. So when we increase someone's physical activity and therefore reduce sedentary behavior, just how much they're at rest, uh, we can see the reductions in anxiety and stress and depression. Um, you might have heard the terms uh, behavioral activation. So basically just means doing things. Um, but that's our fancy research term for it. Uh, and yeah, so that's been getting increasing attention. And then even other you know, fields or subdomains of mental health we've been paying some attention to. So whether that's Alzheimer's, um, schizophrenia and severe mental illnesses, but also ADHD as of late. So why is that the case? So a little bit of background, the neuropsychology of ADHD, uh, I wanna spend some time talking about that. So there's four key brain systems implicated in how the impairments associated with ADHD manifest. So. The first one is what we would call like a non-executive attention arousal. So this is, think about why do stimulants work for ADHD? Well, because we know there's underactivation, particularly in the prefrontal cortex for individuals with ADHD. And so there's a lower resting rate arousal for those individuals. And then this is kind of the sustained attention. So being able to maintain that focus over a longer period of time. So that's one domain. The next one is executive function and cognitive control. So that includes uh, inhibition, response inhibition. So a stimuli being in your environment and reducing the immediate impulse of engaging with that stimulus or um, attending to the stimulus. Uh, working memory, so it's kind of you know, your ability to hold on to something in your brain in the short term maybe do a mental manipulation, so like mental math, and then producing a response, you know, what is three plus four. Next one is motivation or reinforcement. Um, so individuals with ADHD uh, typically have the response pattern of being very incentivized by immediate rewards. Um, it's very salient, um, but those long delayed rewards, um, you know, think about like kind of doing uh, retirement. You know, in the short term, it doesn't really give me much of a dopamine kick, but in the long run, this really benefits me. That's where we see big differences in individuals with ADHD versus uh, neurotypical brains. And then next is kind of temporal information processing. So this is kind of like the time blindness. Um, so the time estimation of, well, how long will this task take me, as well as just what time is it? How much time has gone by? And Many of these systems are implicated in, uh, in the benefits associated with physical exercise. So let's, let's dive into that a little bit. So again, we know that physical exercise has a variety of benefits uh, for individuals with and without ADHD across cognitive domains. But one of the things that we find is that, um, you know, there's so many domains that there's a robust literature showing that these executive functions, so your ability to self-regulate yourself for these long-term goals is disproportionately affected in a, in a positive way by physical exercise. So again, while it can have a global impact on cognitive functioning, it seems to be particularly beneficial for those executive functions, the areas uh, implicated in a lot of ADHD-related impairment. Next is, so the neuropsychological effects are seem to be greater for individuals who have a baseline like deficit. So this is done, uh, this has been found by some research 
who've been looking at Alzheimer's patients, who their baseline cognitive levels relative to their same age peers is a bit lower. And they found that when they do an exercise intervention, they both improve, but those with that baseline deficit actually seem to get a greater degree of improvement. So we can also think about it like slopes. One slope is a little bit greater. So the degree to which they improve is larger for individuals who are a little bit below the, the norm. Uh, also brain structure and functioning. So one of the things that we know is that physical exercise associated with an upregulation of brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Don't worry about that, just BDNF. Um, so these are implicated in the survival of neurons, the synapse formation and synaptic plasticity. And where that gets really exciting, maybe I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Yeah, I'll wait for that. Don't worry, it's just foreshadowing. Um, and then, uh, so that has to do with brain development, basically. And it's one of the few things you can do after your brain is fully matured in its mid to late uh, 20s to um, promote neurogenesis in the brain. So keep that in mind. Um, and then we also know that physical exercise is associated with increased dopamine and norepinephrine, uh, which are the two primary mechanisms through which stimulant medication is thought to work and benefit those with ADHD. Um, the degree to which it affects those is not the same, um, uh, certainly not, but the fact that it's similar to those mechanisms is encouraging and leads us to wonder, you know, well, what about exercise for those with ADHD? Um, plug, uh, let's see, uh, Dr. Hartung, my advisor in grad school, and I published a paper in the ADHD report uh, detailing a bit about the potential benefits for physical exercise for, this was for young adults with ADHD, but it generalizes for most individuals with ADHD. And then also you can check out that YouTube video that I did with Jessica. Um, uh, yeah, she's fantastic and is great at communicating scientific ideas. I highly encourage you to check that out, um, explaining why exercise can be beneficial for those with ADHD in a fun and encouraging way. So especially if you wanna you know, do some education with your kid. I think that's a great video to check out. Um, so getting back into it, so why ADHD? Um, what, what makes this uniquely beneficial? So someone on my dissertation committee, I did a study on the short-term benefits of high intensity exercise for college students with ADHD relative to non-ADHD peers. And one of them levied a good and hard question of why, who cares? Um, so why don't we just tell everyone, eat better, sleep better, exercise better. Uh, we know that, Patrick, why, why is this interesting? And to be fair, I hadn't thought about it that deeply. Um, and one of the things that we talked about, again, in that last slide is just the uh, disproportionate effect that it has on individuals with ADHD potentially because of the neurobiological mechanisms that it affects. Uh, the baseline cognitive functioning of individuals with ADHD versus non-ADHD peers, as well as the executive functioning systems that are impaired among individuals with ADHD, and exercise seems to disproportionately improve in the general population. So another thing too is there's increasing literature showing that ADHD arguably is a health problem, a, an indicator of health problems in adulthood. Uh, Dr. Barkley and Dr. Fisher uh, published in the uh, Journal of Attention Disorders last year and uh, about the correlates of ADHD to decrease or to future morbidity. Um, and I believe it was close to 10 years um, life reduction or five to 10. I'd have to go back to it, but it was very compelling work in the extent to which ADHD uh, was a predictor of these uh, reduced life expectancy uh, estimates versus you know, alcohol consumption, uh, sedentary behavior, things like that was pretty encouraging, or not encouraging, but uh, eye-opening. Um, we also know that individuals with ADHD are less physically active. Um, 
this has been some burgeoning research. And while in childhood, it's a little bit, and we see that once we hit adolescence, we, we start to see that separation. And then in adulthood, that gap gets even wider. Um, so that's even work that uh, Dr. Hartung and Judah Serrano are doing at the University of Wyoming, shout out to them, um, looking at different physical activity levels of individuals with ADHD and how is that affecting outcomes? So. Uh, body fat composition, bone mineral density, um, so how strong your bones are, your cardiovascular fitness, blood pressure, resting heart rate, things like that. And the other thing too is, again, there's, there's literature showing that exercise has a beneficial effect for those with ADHD. Um, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done and it's nowhere near the effects of a good psychosocial intervention or uh, well-managed ADHD medication on the average. Um, so it's a good like maybe compliment or for whatever reason access or there's personal reasons uh, you don't want to engage in those interventions. This is something you can do that maybe will have an effect, but the evidence doesn't suggest that it's at all similar as far as the size of the effect. So right now, there's still a lot of limitations and areas for future research. So first is a uh, difference in terminology. So physical exercise versus physical activity. This is something that even in the research community, you know, we're supposed to be very um, detailed oriented and sometimes we use terms interchangeably that we shouldn't. So physical exercise is basically doing something for the purpose of improving physical fitness. So this idea of like a scheduled activity, whether that's a rec sport, going to the gym or CrossFit. Um, and then physical activity is kind of an umbrella term. How much are you moving? Um, and that's different if we're talking about, well, should we improve the physical activity of individuals with ADHD versus engaging in physical exercise? Uh, these are two different questions and both things that are being explored currently. The other thing is chronic versus acute effects. So my dissertation, they came in, they did, uh, I think it was about 16 minutes of high intensity intervals on an Aerodyne bike, and then they got a bit of rest and they did some computer tasks. Uh, that's an acute effect, we did that once. Uh, versus what if they engage in a program three times a week over the course of five weeks, what happens? Um, we, yeah, still need to answer you know, what is the right dosage or titration for individuals with ADHD? Um, is it good just to recommend acute effects versus these chronic, is it the staying on top of physical activity more important or just doing a run before you're trying to study? Is that more important? Um, and is there a compounding benefit to exercise? Um, both have been encouraging and both have been shown to be beneficial largely, uh, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done there to clarify some things. Uh, objective versus subjective reporting. So. This is, you know, whether somebody self-reports like, yeah, I feel better. I feel like I'm doing better versus an objective, you know, computer task. Um, that's been mixed in the literature. Uh, what's the intensity level? Uh, how, how hard should I work? Uh, this is a question we'll get to in the next ones um, as far as concrete recommendations. But uh, is it more important that I do a short, really intense exercise or a long, steady exercise. Um, does it have to be intense? What are the answers there? Uh, there's huge variability in the mode of interventions that researchers are looking at. Uh, that can be Tai Chi, group sports, perceptual motor water exercise. Do you know what that is? I don't. Um, but so we're looking at it through various lenses, which is good in the sense of getting great diversity. But what makes that hard is because of that heterogeneity in the modes of exercise, it's hard to make concrete conclusions. Again, because how many times a week are they together? Is it a group activity versus individual? Uh, what's the intensity level of that exercise? Is it aerobic exercise versus uh, resistance training, like doing squats? Um, yeah. Theoretical mechanisms of change. So this is something, again, looking at dopamine upregulation and brain-derived neurotrophic factors. Um, Oh, and I didn't get back to BDNF, uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factors. So uh, yeah, that's one of the things that is potentially encouraging is this is something 
that might be able to yield long-term improvements um, rather than we know with medication and behavioral parent training, psychosocial interventions, skill building exercise, that a lot of those effects seem to taper off pretty dramatically the second they stop. Um, and this is something me and my colleagues have been wondering is could exercise yield sustained long-term benefits for individuals with ADHD because we are promoting neurogenesis in the brain? We don't know. I think it's exciting, um, but I'm also biased. Uh, but it's, it, it's exciting to be in that research. Um, so now getting back to the limitations, uh, underrepresentation of women. Um, this is a general problem in most fields, uh, but yeah, especially when it's coming to physical exercise, and I can attest to this uh, with my dissertation, we recruited a lot more men. Men were wanting to engage in the study more than women. So, but that also tells us something if, you know, maybe there's a reason why men are seeking this out versus women. Uh, maybe it has a differential effect or it's moderated um, by gender or sex. Uh, these are questions we're, we're working on. And that's also why we made sure to recruit an even distribution of men and women uh, for that study. Um, lack of diagnostic screening, that's just good screening criteria. That's, yeah, don't need to get into that. Um, and yeah, there's just been little details on what was the control group. Um, so comparing physical exercise to something else, um, if they're just sitting and they're bored, they're not doing anything, is that a representative or a good control uh, to compare, you know, a recess group? Um, and then also reporting on medication status. Uh, so, great, Patrick, what can we do? Um, and I'll preface all this that a lot of it, um, this is kind of the next phase of research, is we know there's some beneficial effects here. And while there's still more work to be done, how do we get this implemented in the real world? Um, so the overall thing, theme with these recommendations is thinking about greasing the wheels in the direction that you want to be going. So let's say increasing physical activity or exercise and adding friction to, you know, canceling at the last minute, um, bailing on your workout buddy, things like that. Um, so you want to make it harder to not exercise, and you also want to make it easier to exercise. So what are some concrete ways you can do that? First off, accountability, accountability. So if you uh, want to play tennis with a friend, um, that could be a great way to do it is, you know, if you don't show up, they can't play tennis. So you're holding your both, your, both of yourselves accountable to coming to that activity. Um, so having accountability there, um, having people check in on you, um, things like that. Uh, preparation, so that can be setting out your gym clothes and everything the night before, um, sleeping in your gym clothes. So you just have to roll out of bed, uh, making your coffee, I do that. Um, I, I have it set the night before, so it's just, it wakes me up. Um, anything that just makes it easier so you know, when you're in your bed and you're like, oh, but I still have to, did I even do laundry? Do I even have clean shorts? Like just removing that friction and greasing the wheels. Uh, another one is novelty. Um, some people like to do the same thing over and over again, um, but a lot of times people want things that are changed up. That's part of the reason I like CrossFit personally is um, it's different every time. Um, sometimes we're doing squats, sometimes we're doing sprints, sometimes we're doing rope climbs. Uh, Sometimes it's partner workouts and I don't have to think about what is programmed for that day. Um, so that might be bar classes, that might be hockey drills or, um, you know, whatever else, something that's just, it's got some novelty to it. Um, or I believe there's some passes that <clears throat> you can buy or like monthly subscription programs where you get like X amount of like passes to go to various types of gyms. So if you want to do soul cycle one day and you want to do kickboxing another day, you can kind of change things up. Uh, another one, I think we've all fallen into this trap, start slow. Um, it's so much more important that you're able to work out tomorrow than destroying yourself um, and then being out for a week. 
the volume is so much more important than the intensity, I would say, at this stage. So again, the volume is much more important than the intensity. Um, it's way more important that you're building those habits of just doing steady physical activity than to you know, potentially injure yourself by going way too hard, putting yourself out of commission, um, exhausting yourself for the rest of the day and not getting that same like natural reward or that like runner's high that some people report. Um, start slow, take it easy. And of course, if you have any medical contraindications or believe that you might have any restrictions to engaging in physical exercise, consult with your doctor. Um, uh, I'm not a medical professional. So yes, you should do that. However, generally speaking, physical activity is kind of a do no harm recommendation. Um, so other one is consistency routine. This kind of gets to starting slow. Uh, it's much more important that you can try to build that consistency, that routine. Sometimes people like morning workouts. I think those people are foreign. I don't I, I, I don't know how you do that. Um, I personally can't. I've been trying to do it for the last couple of months and I've just, I can't. Um, I personally like doing it at the end of the day because it shuts my brain off. Um, I know other people that do it at their lunch hour because it's a way to break up the monotony of the day. Um, figuring out basically what works for you for you, don't think about other people, you. Um, rewarding yourself, so whether that's you get to listen to that new album, uh, whether that's watching your Netflix show while you're on the treadmill, um, catching up on that podcast while you're going to walk around the park, uh, things making it so there's just, again, a little bit more enjoyable during the task and or after the task. And the other one is tracking your activity. Um, so, Spinoza has a line where he says that reason is no match for passion. So we all know that we should probably not be eating cake. Uh, we should eat more salads, that we should be more physically active. We should sleep better, um, but we don't. We, we're not purely logical creatures. So we have to find another way. Um, Spinoza's idea is that we have to transform reason into a passion. And I take that to mean that we have to begin to develop a great deal of passion for logical understanding. Um, so if only we can inculcate this in a you know, patient, um, you know, a parent, a family, a child, an adult, for curiosity, to fertilize this curiosity about themselves. Um, when we don't have any curiosity about ourselves, that's, that's kind of a bad sign. Um, try to figure out ways to induce curiosity um, with people I work with. And one way you can do that is just tracking your activity. So I've had several patients, this isn't with exercise, but you know, ADHD saying, I know I'm procrastinating in the moment, um, I keep pushing it off, and I know I'm gonna regret it later, and I keep beating myself about it, but I, but I still don't do it. Patrick, what should I do? And I can tell you my first years, couple years of grad school, that was, uh, that was a great question because uh, I did not have an answer. Um, and I still don't necessarily have an answer, but I think what's been helpful is to promote mindfulness and awareness of those decisions. So not saying you shouldn't procrastinate, but just saying, if you do procrastinate, I just want you to do it mindfully. You know, what, what were you feeling in that moment? What were you thinking in that moment? What are some patterns that you're noticing? Um, you know, just bringing awareness to that and doing the same thing for, you know, physical exercise, physical activity. Uh, how enjoyable was that task? How long did it take me? Um, was I able to sleep better afterwards? Did I feel better? Like, did I get an endorphin rush? Was I able to focus more or it was too intense or I didn't like the vibe of that, you know, five o'clock workout group, they seem very clicky and I don't like that. I'm just bringing that curiosity to those tasks and not so much beating yourself up um, and just trying to get some more understanding. And then finally, so if there has to be any concrete recommendations, um, so far evidence suggests that 30 minutes of moderate intensity or about 10 to 15 minutes of a high intensity aerobic exercise, something that gets your heart rate up, you're breathing quickly, are the most promising. However, all exercise is helpful. Um, 
Don't overthink this. Don't think that if you're not on a treadmill or you're running a 5K every day that you are failing or if you didn't go to five CrossFit workouts this week, that that's somehow an indication um, that you're dropping the ball on this. Just do something that you can do regularly, consistently, and enjoy. So wrap things up because I want to make sure we get to your guys' questions. Um, so we talked about the benefits of exercise. Yes, it, there's a robust literature on physical health, but exciting new research on mental health, um, including things that are commonly co-occurring with individuals with ADHD. Stress, depression, anxiety are very high among adolescents and adults with ADHD in particular. So maybe it could be a nice supplement to reduce some of those things. Uh, the neuropsychological factors that can make exercise particularly beneficial. We talked about, again, affecting executive functioning domains. Uh, let's see, improving uh, upregulation of brain-derived neurotropic factors, norepinephrine and dopamine. Um, and then latest research on exercise and ADHD. Um, and I could have beat that over the head. And then, yeah, we talked about those strategies. Um, of how you can then take the research and apply it to the real world. So just want to say genuinely, uh, thank you. Um, it's a genuine privilege uh, to, to serve the ADHD community, um, to hear what you guys are running into, barriers, um, things you find beneficial, rather than being in our echo chambers and ivory towers. Um, it's, it, it takes a lot of vulnerability and bravery to come in and trust a doctor to, to help you, to help your child um, at times when you might be at your worst. So thank you um, for your time and I'm excited to, to get to your questions. Okay, and there were plenty of them. Um... Right. One, one about uh, ADHD, sleep, and exercise. We all know that kids have trouble sleeping. It's pretty, pretty common, and adults as well. And what, how does exercise help or not help with that from the research so, or based on your research? Yeah, uh, we know that physical activity can improve sleep. Um, so particularly initiating sleep, I'm not sure as far as restfulness. There's a lot of aspects to sleep. It's not my particular area of expertise, but I want to know more about that because I've been thinking a lot about the same things is we know that exercise affects the way that you eat, exercise affects the way you sleep. And those two other health lifestyle domains also have an impact on whether you're going to exercise or whether you'd be more physically active. Um, if you sleep more, you're probably going to make wiser decisions. Um, so getting up and going on that run in the morning than if you got too little sleep um, or if you ate a pizza the night before <laughs> versus mm -hmm. something that's lighter, um, you know, that can affect it. So we do know that it can improve that, but then there's just, it's like, okay, so it affects sleep, but then is that because of the exercise necessarily or through other mechanisms? Um, right. Long story short is that it can be helpful, but there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. Right. Uh, one person asks, how long does the increased dopamine and nor norepinephrine levels generated after exercise last in the brain? Do you have- This is really encouraging, yeah. Um, we don't know. Um, this mm -hmm. is, uh, we've been wondering the same thing is we've been making arbitrary measures of when do we, when do we have participants do these tasks? When do we take these measures? Is it 30 minutes after the exercise? Is it two hours after the exercise? You know, we don't know if there's like a big spike and then it drops off or it's, if it's gradual, we don't know. Um, so these are really good questions. <laughs> um, yeah. Right. Um, uh, you referenced Dr. Barkley's study um, about the lower life ex expectancy among people with ADHD. Uh, one person is, why are people with AD, ADHD less active? Is it physiological, psychological, or both? Hmm. Physiological, <laughs> psychological, or both. I mean, it's, it's kind of like the mind-body problem, right? I mean, they're kind of wrapped up in the same uh, because your body affects your psyche and mm -hmm. vice versa. Um, but I imagine a lot of it, at least what we can see, is 
you know, those same executive function systems. Uh, again, sometimes it, those rewards that you're hoping to reap may not be immediately present um, or accrued. So the easier example is if I'm trying to improve my physical fitness and I'm engaging in physical exercise, it takes a while to, to see the effects of that. Um, and if that's what you're looking for, um, for individuals with ADHD, again, we talked about how salient immediate rewards are versus those long delayed rewards. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably a bit of that and just self-regulating planning ahead. Um, the time awareness, it might be, oh no, it was five, it's at five, but now I just looked at the clock and it's 5.15, I completely forgot. Or no, I left my keys at home and I can't get into the gym without my little tag and crap. Like, so it's a lot of kind of the same ADHD problems that individuals have to manage manifesting in the context with ADHD. Mm -hmm. A lot of people asking, um, does strength training help in terms of the benefits of exercise versus just doing aerobic or is combining both of them an even better solution? A lot of people asking that. So great questions. Yeah. So I believe there's, Somebody in Australia actually just forwarded me a paper on resistance training or what, yeah, strength training for, uh, and the benefits of that for ADHD. And I believe they were positive, um, but I haven't read into that. Most of the work has been done on aerobic exercise. Um, that's the one that seems to influence those neuropsychological pathways a bit more. Um, however, like I said before, um, do what fits for you. Um, I know me personally, I'm, I'm not a runner. Um, I've tried to love it. I've really tried, um, <laughs> it's, it's so hard. And I'm yeah. also a strength training person or I try to change things up. Um, and I think doing any of those will be beneficial. Again, don't, don't overthink this guys. Um, just, just do what you can do and you find personally meaningful and rewarding, um, rather than trying to shoehorn yourself into doing like, if, if we found out that uh, figure skating was the best way to improve your executive functions or to improve your fitness, I personally have a hard time with that. Um, I'm not very good at figure skating and I like group based <laughs> exercises and, you know, all these things. Um, so just do what you can. Uh, I, there, there are beneficial effects of that, but they may not. They might be some slight differences. Mm -hmm. What about the interplay between exercise ADHD and stimulant medication? Well, getting more exercise, let's say you don't respond well to stimulant medication, will that Im perhaps improve the response? Uh, or for people who, who are doing pretty well on stimulant medication, will exercise make it perhaps more effective? Interesting. So if you're trying a stimulant medication and you supplement and it's not working and you supplement it with exercise, could it maybe now make it work? And then if you are taking a stimulant and it's helping, could exercise make it work even more? Right. Um, I, I think though, I'm not aware of any work on that, but um, it's an interesting question. Uh, I imagine again, they affect a lot of the same um, neurobiological mechanisms as those with stimulants. Um, but a lot of times what might be easier is just a, general uh, a comment, um, talk to your doctors. Um, I, a lot of patients I've worked with, um, I'm surprised that they'll say, well, I have this side effect. Well, have you talked to your doctor about it? It's like, no, they just recommended it and I've been taking this for 10 years. Um, hopefully your doctor should be receptive to any feedback like that. If I kind of want to try something else or I'm having this side effect and you guys can have that discussion. Um, so, so there's that, but also, I guess, again, back to one of those recommendations, just track it, um, track what is, what is my experience right now? What do I want to get out of exercise? Do I want to be able to calm my brain down before I start studying? Um, do mm -hmm. I want to help me turn my brain off at the end of the day? Do I want to get it started? Um, so label that and then engage in the exercise and ask yourself afterwards, how did that go? Um, how did that affect me on days when I was taking my medication versus not taking my medication? And you can kind of be your own, your own scientist in that way. Because again, all the research we do, this is something to keep in mind, all the research we do is on the mean. 
it is the average of people. So just because we get these huge effects on this treatment, you know, there's all these like little data points over here saying like, oh, look at that and improved. That doesn't mean there might be a couple people who didn't move. Things got worse. Um, so I really want to encourage people to, to think of themselves as their own little scientist um, mm -hmm. to help answer some of those questions. Yeah. Are there, I, I think I know the answer, but are there any gender specific recommendations? Someone saying what would be the best exercise for a teen female? But you've already mentioned that there are a lot of females haven't even been included in some in the study. So I know that would be probably limit mm -hmm. any kind of response. But then there's also the whole thing of kids versus adults. I mean, is this sort of a a general average, the 15 and 30 minutes you mentioned of, of aerobic exercise, or uh, do we get yeah. any kind of specific recommendations as we break into different age groups or, I don't know, just ask. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't really speak to as far as uh, if there should be any differences in the mode or intensity of exercise other than just making it age appropriate. Um, you know, you don't, <laughs> uh, you might wanna make the, in more of a game for a younger individual versus an adult may not want to make it quite as childish or game-like. Um, and so, yeah, I think generally those span the age um, spectrum. However, I'm not aware of any research that's looked at differences again, because this is a pretty uh, new area of work for people in our field. Um, but, and then as far as gender differences, again, there's so much work that needs to be done there. Um, however, the one thing I would say is keeping in mind what type of exercise um, you might design or consider based on this for your daughter, for your son. Um, this was actually been trying to work with some schools to get some partnerships here. And that was some feedback I got was, I phrased a program that we're working on as physical exercise. And they said, I'm not sure many of the teen girls are gonna wanna do that. Um, but if you did something that was like yoga or Tai Chi or wasn't group based or like there's a lot of, you know, maybe it's like body image stuff, uh, bullying that can go on. Um, we know that individuals with ADHD a lot of times can be delayed in their motor development relative to same age peers. So doing a group sport and feeling like the worst player might make it hard to go back and engage in that physical exercise. Mm -hmm. So thinking more about those factors, again, what, what's going to be enjoyable and palatable for your child, uh, you know, your boy, your girl, um, just that works for, for them. Um, otherwise, I'm, again, not aware of any research that would show that aerobic exercise is particularly beneficial for men versus women. Yeah. Yeah. Someone has asked if, I mean, you're talking about aerobic exercise, and then someone has asked, will yoga help uh, mm -hmm. my child? Will, will I derive some of the same benefits that I'd be getting from aerobic exercise? So there have been several questions about uh, adding yoga to a, an exercise menu. So I'm just asking about that. Yeah, I, th I think um, if we collapse yoga, you know, you, it is more, more physically active than maybe just sitting and doing meditation. Um, you might be sitting in poses and stretching. Um, it, it might still have that same beneficial effect, not necessarily through the physical activity or exercise pathways, but just through traditional meditation. And we know that there's a decent enough literature there. Again, that shows that it can be helpful, maybe not as a sole intervention, to address all the problems that uh, adults, uh, teens, families encounter with ADHD, but can maybe ameliorate some of those problems. So uh, absolutely, yeah, yoga, Tai Chi, anything like that could, could certainly be helpful. Okay, uh, once again, back to that BDNF, I think. Anyway, are the positive effects on neurotropic factors cumulative and long lasting? I think this is a little bit different than the other question I asked. Or is there a spike after exercise and then a return to baseline? So, hmm. <laughs> yeah, we know that exercise, regardless, so that acute effect 
generally speaking, there should be an upregulation of brain-derived neurotropic factors. Um, I'm not oh, I'm not sure if uh, if you're engaging in activity regularly, if there's some kind of compounding effect. Um, I imagine it's compounding in the sense that, well, if you're promoting neurogenesis over and over and over and over again, like that's just naturally compounding. But there's no there's no like interest on top of that, I would think. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't thought about that. That's a great question. Hmm. Yeah. What about, well, we all know that, uh, you know, adults and, and kids with ADHD do have trouble regulating emotions. There are a lot of parents asking about my, my kid seems to get angry very easily. Uh, is there any, any research on the, um, the effect of exercise on, on strong emotion? So that was something with my dissertation. Granted, this was with college students. Um, we had a measure of emotional impulsivity. Um, so that's kind of like the like intense like swings of those emotions guiding behavior. Um, and that was actually one of our largest effects was that. And anecdotally, that's something I've heard from patients um, is that it helps them, again, kind of with that stress, the anxiety, depression, uh, ameliorate or improve those domains. Um, so I would imagine in much the same way, and you know, my work and my dissertation that I'm submitting here, uh, pretty soon for publication uh, is would suggest that yes, it, it would help that. Um, again, would it completely resolve the problem? I don't know. Um, and again, that was with college students, but I would think a lot of times that physical activity can help improve emotion regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So people are asking about swimming, bicycling, I guess, as long as it has that aerobic component. And mm -hmm. I guess I guess we need to discuss since you've mentioned aerobics being 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 sort of front and center as, as a good as a good exercise. Uh, what do you mean by aerobic, I guess? Do you have to keep your heart rate up uh, to a certain level for a certain per set period of time? I guess I guess we could because bicycling and swimming or running or anything could could be aerobic. Is aerobic. Yeah, great question. Right. So, so um, I guess, so starting off with the aerobic aspect of things, I, yeah, I'm not sure why the field, I mean, I guess I could, I could have a guess as to why the field is looking at that um, mostly, to be fair, I did that with my dissertation too, is just there's, that's where most of the work has been done, is aerobic exercise. And even just in general populations, the resistance training hasn't been looked at as much as far as the extent to which it yields beneficial effects for um, neuropsychological functioning. Um, so, so there's that. It might just be that, well, we've always done it this way, so why don't we keep doing it, which isn't good. Um, so I think people doing this res resistance training work are, um, yeah, could potentially yield some fruitful findings that help guide these sorts of questions or answers to these questions rather. And then the question of what is aerobic exercise? So right. that's the, I don't have a good operational term, uh, which the kinesiologists on my team would probably get on me for. But it, I would think about it, anything that gets your heart rate up is steady state, uh, moderate, so that's like 50% of your max heart rate. Um, you can do really simple calculations of that. I think it's 120 minus your age um, times, so 0 0.50 would be 50% of your max heart rate. That's a crude estimate, but it's an estimate. Um, and so you wanna maintain that heart rate for about 30 minutes. Um, that would be like a moderate intensity uh, aerobic exercise. Um, so something where you're, you're continually moving, you're breathing more heavily, and your heart rate is increasing. Where resistance training is, you know, it's pushing, pulling, um, squatting, um, and you might be taking breaks in between those movements rather than just continually moving for all 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, that's the way I would think about it. And then yeah. if anything, I'm not sure if this was a question, if any of those are particularly beneficial or useful, again, just getting back to the, the root of it, 
what works for you or your child, your family. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And one, one last thing. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I, I guess you'd be a millionaire if you could answer this one, but a lot of people have exercised and stopped. Procrastination has gotten in the way. Um, you know, a, the ADHD, uh, Procrastination is, is a big negative in terms of exercise. Um, but perhaps what you're saying, get passionate about something and that'll keep you going, perhaps? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, this is a question. Yeah, this, this would be a million dollar question. Um, I wish I had the answer so I could get that million dollars from whoever would award me that. Uh, but yeah, no, this is, our work is all good. And this has been a problem with a lot of our field um, that I think we're starting to address more recently is great in a lab, this works in a tightly controlled setting. This works right. more paying participants to do this. Um, when we're incentivizing them to engage in this program, it works, but then we try to do it in the real world. Nobody's doing it. People <laughs> are dropping out. It's too expensive. It's too time consuming. The, you know, insurance won't cover it. So, I think, and that's something that's vexed me is how do we get, you know, again, this is, this is an activity that just for the general population as a whole, we're bad at. We know logically we should be more active. We shouldn't be eating that cake. Um, sugar really doesn't, like it has no beneficial value to us other than it, it tastes still, it's great. It's fantastic, objectively <laughs> great. Yeah. Um, so, but, but why do we, we know that it, it brings no other benefit to our life and only risk. Um, right. So how do we take this, we're already having this general health problem to a population where it's almost by definition harder to, to engage in these things, to change things consistently, right. regularly. Um, and that's vexed me. And I, I think... Yeah, I mean, I'm hoping to to keep working on that right. because it's important. But I think the yeah, the passion, the curiosity, um, you know, drawing attention to why didn't I engage at that? Like, what you know, problem solving. You know, I, I skipped again. Like, instead of beating yourself up, just well, what went wrong? Well, I was exhausted at the end of the day, and it's really hard to get myself motivated to go home and do this and then go to the gym. It's like, okay, so what is something I can do again to grease those wheels, to reduce that friction? Um, right. You know, th I would think that's a decent way to start, but honestly, there's a lot of work to be done. I think maybe integrating it more into a school day. So it's just structured and scheduled and that's what you mm -hmm. do. Yeah, that's um, a good that idea. idea. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, as far as getting yourself, if you're an individual with ADHD, to then overcome those obstacles to engage in that exercise regularly. Um, I think fostering that curiosity and attention to yourself uh, can right. be meaningful. Yeah. Well, I think the hour is up. You had great mm -hmm. stuff, Patrick, a lot of great insights and strategies. And uh, we really appreciate it, um, sharing oh, your expertise you. on this. I, I know I got a lot out of it. I'm sure everyone else did. And thanks again, really. Of course. No, thank you. Okay. It's been a pleasure. Uh, once again, today's webinar sponsors, Play Attention. Play Attention utilizes NASA-inspired technology to strengthen executive function and self-regulation. Mm -hmm. We will customize your plan. They will customize your plan and help you thrive at home, school, and work. Includes a lifetime membership. Learn how you can make ADHD your superpower. Click here, the hyperlink, for a free consultation or call 1-800-788-6786. Or, of course, visit playattention.com. Mention Attitude Mag 0220 and receive 10% off your home or professional program and one free ADHD assessment. We'll see you next week, everyone, uh, when Coach Linda Walker will share her five secrets to productivity uh, by understanding the ADHD brain. See you then, and have a great day.